is a faculty member of the UCSB Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. He's the principal investigator at the Meta Lab. How about this? Is this better? Yeah. Let's try it again. Dr. Jonathan Schooler is a faculty member of the UCSB Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences. He is the principal investigator at the Meta Lab, Memory, Emotion, Thought, Awareness. To quote him, my lab's research takes a big picture perspective in attempting to understand the nature of mental life, and in particular, consciousness. Combining empirical, that is scientific, philosophical, and contemplative traditions, we address broad questions that cross traditional disciplinary boundaries. Among the topics his lab addresses are mindfulness, meta-awareness, that is awareness of your own mental processes, your own thoughts, mind-wandering, Creativity, emotion, recovered memories, eyewitness testimony, anomalous cognition, that is, parapsychology, and free will. And I'm going to ask him all about all those things right now. <laughs> Actually, I have, I have 24 questions that I made of, which we probably won't get to all 24, but. Um, um, as many as I can, uh, we'll go. Okay. So, um, not uh, not wading in uh, gently. What's the relationship between consciousness and the brain? <clears throat> uh, well, there is a standard answer uh, for that in neuroscience, which is simply that consciousness uh, emerges from brain processes and that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the activity of the brain and consciousness, that you can't have a consciousness without a brain, uh, and that uh, essentially uh, brains generate consciousness. There's some debate in the neuroscience field uh, regarding whether or not consciousness is uh, simply what's known as an epiphenomenon. That is, it's like this steam coming out of the top of the um, train, which itself is having no impact, or whether it's a critical uh, element in a causal chain. Uh, but uh, in the, according to the standard view, um, that's, there's a little bit of debate about that. Another place where there's a debate is whether or not, um, at, at what level, of uh, brains consciousness emerges. So does it emerge, you know, in fish, or does it require self-awareness? And there's debates about that. There's a small fringe of uh, neuroscientists and a, a, a larger set of uh, philosophers and thinkers about consciousness who question that view and who feel that um, it's possible that consciousness is some type of fundamental aspect of reality, and there's, for example, um, a, a variation known as panpsychism, which is the idea that consciousness is embedded in uh, everything at some level and organizes into larger and larger structures under certain specified situations, such as life. Uh, personally, uh, I find myself leaning towards the more radical view that consciousness uh, is, uh, in some sense, an essential aspect of reality uh, that is not simply uh, a product of the brain. But I recognize that that's a metaphysical view for which, um, at present, there's uh, some suggestive bits of evidence, but nothing that's compelling and that it's entirely defensible and appropriate to hold the what's known as the material reductionist view. The only thing that I find problematic about the material reductionist view is its unwillingness to even acknowledge that other views might be defensible. Well. <laughs> that was very beautifully put. Thank you. Thank you.
and I think these folks think too. Um, okay, so then uh, some of these questions are going to be kind of, uh, you kind of already answered them by your initial question, but um, so you can, some of these will be fairly briefly answered. So the question is, do we each have a separate consciousness or is there any shared aspect to consciousness? Okay, so, and again, you'll, you'll see my answer is always going to end up with uh, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so that's, you know, we can just end the interview there. Um, but um, let me try to give you a sort of model that I've been playing with with respect to the nature of consciousness. In some ways it is a, a panpsychist model. And it does potentially provide a way of thinking about um, this sort of notion of shared consciousness with an interesting catch. Uh, so the model uh, draws on, have you ever seen these pictures? They are paintings that are made of paintings, so every individual pixel is itself a painting. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can imagine that as a model where uh, each consciousness is itself a window which is looking out on smaller windows that are pixels and itself a pixel of a larger window. And so I think that actually consciousness, when you have your experience of consciousness, you're um, looking at uh, almost like a, a mosaic of smaller consciousnesses that are doing smaller apprehensions but still having their own experience and creating, in a sense, a window that they're having as their experience and you see as one of the pixels in your larger window. So it's, I call these nested observer windows, or nows, right? And each nested observer window is itself nowing and serving as a pixel in a larger now. Uh, now, now, uh, <laughs> from that perspective, each one of us could be a pixel in some larger window, which would then be the, uh, the sort of the group consciousness. And here's the interesting catch, but that window could itself be a pixel in a larger window and a larger window. So you always want to be cautious of the hubris of thinking that you're the final window. <laughs> that is such a, that's such an interesting way to look at it. It's such a beautiful model. Um, Freeman Dyson, the physicist at um, Princeton, used to say that it's infinite in all directions. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've met I met for you. Yeah, because um, this is a, a parallel uh, view of the um, conscious universe. Okay, then does consciousness end with death? <laughs> so uh, of course uh, the answer is going to be predictably maybe maybe not. Um, <laughs> I am again. Uh, a, 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 a great, a, a small minority of um, uh, mainstream scientists who are willing to entertain the idea uh, that uh, scientifically, it's interesting that they'll oftentimes have re be religious and yet when they put on their scientific hat, no, that's impossible. Um, the, the really interesting thing here is, uh, well, there's lots of interesting things, of course, there is some curious uh, research done by uh, Stevenson in, um, at Virginia looking at some sort of suggestive evidence for a reincarnation. Uh, Robert and I are in a consciousness group and we reviewed that evidence and it suggested but, but far, from, uh, far from conclusive. The, the most sort of intriguing line on this, I think, are near-death experiences. And in near-death experiences, what you find is uh, a significant minority of people having a very uh, sort of surprisingly consistent set of um, things happen to the, or things that they report after they uh, return from being clinically uh, dead. Uh, usually, this is a matter of five to fifteen minutes, in which they, you know, you know the story. They experience moving towards the light. They experience life review. They oftentimes experience encountering loved ones or deceased pets, uh, and then there's some sort of, uh, they see themselves hovering over the body, uh, and then they uh, feel a return. And when they return, they uh, have this strong sense that it was realer than real, that, that they're now persuaded that they were 
in some other realm. And there also are a number of reports of them having access to information in the operating theater or around that they shouldn't have had access to uh, given that they were um, uh, clinically dead. Um, so uh, that's intriguing evidence. And I've, it's interesting, I've spoken about the evidence for this both to, I forgot, there's a local organization of, of survivors of mm -hmm. near-death experiences, and also to um, uh, critical uh, scientists. And I've managed to sort of annoy both, both sides, which <laughs> I feel shows that I'm doing something right. Uh, so uh, from the, uh, the vantage of the, the, the neuroscientists, uh, this, I think, is uh, is suggestive. Um, people don't even need to believe in these things. So it's not just like they're just thinking through some um, some model that they had and then reproducing that afterwards. Even people who didn't believe in this kind of experience uh, reported. On the other hand, there are uh, explanations for these types of things. For example, uh, people who have uh, what are known as REM intrusions. And a REM intrusion is where you're half awake, half asleep, oftentimes it's associated with sleep paralysis, uh, people with REM intrusions are more than 200% more likely to have near-death experiences. So it's possible that near-death experiences are some sort of REM intrusion, REM is what happens when you're dreaming, that takes place when you are uh, dying. It's also interesting, they've looked at, this is kind of morbid, but they, they look at the brain activity of rats uh, as uh, when they cause when they've caused cardiac arrest, and there's actually this remarkable burst uh, of energy. So brains seem to do rather remarkable things uh, when they're dying. So it's possible that this is not entering into some uh, afterlife, but simply the way uh, the brain shuts down. You know why the brain would shut down in that way? Why does it do life review? It, it, it's, it's intriguing to speculate about if this is just a natural process. What possible purpose would it have uh, to do that? So, maybe, maybe not. <laughs> um, if consciousness continues to evolve, that is, get, uh, in the natural world is getting more complex as uh, creatures evolve, um, if consciousness continues to evolve, what will eventually result? Is consciousness growing toward something? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's clearly growing towards something. It's quite remarkable to look at the speed of the uh, evolution of consciousness. If you just look at how much progress has been made in the last 5,000 years uh, is amazing. If you look at how much progress has been made in the last 500 years, it's amazing. If you look at how much progress has been made in the last 100 years, it's amazing. If you look at how much progress has been made in the last 20 years, it's amazing. And it seems like it's going faster and faster and faster. So it seems like the cultural evolution of consciousness is really uh, moving in, in leaps and bounds and, and really means we should be uh, quite open-minded about the possibility of where it could be going. A couple of thoughts on where it might be going. Um, there is, as some of you may have heard, this notion of the singularity, that machines could possibly become conscious, that we could possibly put ourselves into machines, um, and that's uh, the machines will take over the world and replace us, and that's kind of intriguing. Um, some people think it, that that's our natural evolution, that it's not, we're not to be, should be scared about the machines taking over, that that's actually, we will eventually evolve into uh, machines. There's also the idea that we will get better and better at creating um, simulations uh, and uh, start to uh, create simulations of ourselves to see, well, what would happen if it worked like this, if it worked like that. And if we are able to create simulations of ourselves, then perhaps we're already in a simulation. And if you think about it, if the universe has been big banging, doing big bangs and big bangs and big bangs, and has been creating consciousnesses uh, for an infinity of time, 
then it seems quite plausible that um, it would have come up with some amazing tricks in an infinity of opportunities of uh, arising. And creating a simulation seems a natural thing. Perhaps creating a simulation in which it reproduces itself so that we are all in a simulation of, uh, of consciousness which has been evolving and, and doing this uh, for an eternity. So perhaps we will evolve into a, a conscious um, collective uh, and create simulations of ourselves. The last thing I'll say on this, just sort of a crazy wild idea, but there's this idea of the second law of thermodynamics where we're increasingly moving towards entropy and this is like the most uh, well-established sort of law uh, that there is. But it's also interesting that at the same time that we are getting increasing physical chaos, we're also getting increasing uh, mental organization and understanding. And it's just like a wild conjecture of mine that perhaps the rate of increasing chaos is, is, is conserved by an increasing understanding of consciousness. And so that uh, it's basically a transformation of information uh, from uh, physical to mental. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of happy that I'm talking to him. <laughs> we're, we're talking to him. <laughs> okay. um, all right. I wrote it. Is greater intelligence is a greater intelligence orchestrating the development of consciousness? <laughs> uh, well, so again, maybe, maybe not. But, um, but again, this idea of simulation. If you follow through with the idea in physics currently, which is that the reason why they think there's this known as the anthropic principle, which is that um, why is it that all the values are exactly the way that they should be in order for uh, consciousness to be able to have evolved, and there's like, a, like countless values and that'd be exactly right. And they're trying to figure out why would it be exactly right. So now, uh, one explanation, uh, it's really choose your poison. One explanation is that uh, we got colossally lucky, we wouldn't have, it, it, it just happened to be this way, but we never would have known it was this way unless it happened to be that way. So it's colossally lucky, but that is bizarre that it's so lucky. Another possibility is that there is some sort of larger intelligence that set things up, set the parameters just right. And the third possibility, and this is the possibility that the a grand, uh, or the, the sort of this increasing sort of view among um, the, the physics intelligentsia is that there is many big bangs happening again and again and again, and if you big bang enough, eventually uh, one of them will uh, have the properties. Now, of course, if there have been big banging and big banging, as I mentioned before, then that stands to reason that it's been big banging for an eternity. There's been an eternity of opportunities of big bangs, which means uh, an eternity of opportunities for consciousness to arise and do things. And we've already seen the expansive capabilities of consciousness and picking up steam. So the idea of creating, of consciousness creating simulations in which consciousness exists in the simulations becomes quite plausible. And so if you just follow through the material reductionist view that consciousness emerges from certain uh, physical things and that we can uh, have big banging and big banging and big banging, then it stands to reason eventually there would be a consciousness that emerges that would be able to create simulations of big bangs with consciousnesses within it. And so then we could be essentially in a simulation which is uh, the product of uh, higher order intelligence. Perhaps it's, you know, maybe it's like a third grader in this, you know, next, and that would explain why the world is, is imperfect. It doesn't have to be an omniscient, uh, all present, perfect one. It could be kind of one that's still working it out. <laughs> so we're somebody else's adolescent dream. <laughs> This is all, you're going to have to be um, a little succinct about this one. Are there other levels of consciousness that, uh, you know, staying with who we are? Are there other, do we have other levels of consciousness? And if so, what are they? So, um, I finally get to actually talk about a little bit of research. Um, so, a phenomenon that I uh, have gotten a lot of mileage in on uh, is one that I'm expecting most of you are familiar with. And that is, you are reading along 
and suddenly you realize that although your eyes have been moving across the page, your mind has gone completely elsewhere. How many people are familiar with that experience? Okay, and there's usually sort of this sheepish expression of, yes, welcome to my world. Now, now notice what's going on when you have that experience. When you're reading, you, your intention is to understand the material. You also know that you can't read and at the same time have an entirely unrelated thought. You know, everybody knows that if you do that, you're not extracting the, the reading material. So why do we do it? Why do we keep reading even though we know that this is a totally counterproductive thing to do? And the answer, we think, and we have a fair bit of evidence to support this, is you forget that that's what you're doing. You, you fail to notice that your mind is wandering. You lose track of the contents of your own mind. And then you have this moment of meta-awareness. You realize, oh, I've done it again. I've been mind-wandering for the last thing. And this may also, by the way, happen to you when you're meditating. You're trying to focus on your breath. You're trying to, when your mind wanders, bring it back. And yet you'll find five minutes of the meditation that it's been five minutes since you've, uh, uh, since you've noticed it. So this experience of meta-awareness is, I think, a, another level of consciousness where you're not just having experience, but you're having experience in which you've just checked in on your mind and noticed, oftentimes, that it's not where you expected it to be. <laughs> now, we're also, normally, we do meta-awareness in, in the sort of a verbal propositional way. So we have this experience of, oh, I just mind work again. Oh, I just drove three exits past um, the exit that I wanted to get off on. Um, so oftentimes it's this sort of narrative, you know, kind of an idiot I am kind of thing. Um, but there's another kind of meta-awareness, which is where when you're meditating and you know that you're meditating and you know that your uh, focus is on the breath, but you don't have to keep saying that to yourself. It's a mindful meta-awareness, an intuitive meta-awareness. It's hard to get into because uh, once you... Once you notice that you're doing that, you're oh, look at that, I'm intuitive meta awareness. Oh, there I go, I've just gotten out of it. <laughs> so that leads me to go off script um, and ask you a question that I have no good answer for, um, but that you might. Um, what he's talking about in this second kind of meta awareness is witnessing awareness, right? When you're just purely aware of whatever your mind is doing, um, but you're not thinking in verbal terms, you're just you somehow you wired into your brain the ability to notice that way, and it's a novel ability you're wiring into your brain. No one's ever been able to tell me what. This is a technical question. What do you think is happening in the brain? Is it a, a certain networks getting switched on and switched off in, in a novel way that we have to learn to do? Um, what can you say about that? Uh, well, so there's a network uh, in the brain known as the default network. And this is the network that took them a while to notice because when you have people doing something, the default network tends to be uh, depressed. The executive network and the salience network are active, but the default network is, is sort of quiet. When, you, when people are not doing anything, when they're just uh, sitting uh, idly, that's when the default network uh, seems to become active. This is why it's known as default, because it's what we're doing when we're not doing any, anything else. And it was confusing to neuroscientists that there'd be a region that was more active when you gave them less to do. But so this default network is uh, very active during uh, mind wandering. It's also a critical element in creativity and all sorts of um, uh, valuable things. It's also active in negative things, such as uh, negative rumination. Uh, but I think it is... A negative rumination is where you're thinking about some thought again and again and again, just sort of perseverating on it uh, without really some moving on. And you could even fail to notice that you're doing that, which is uh, worrisome. But uh, I think that uh, when people are in the witnessing mode, what's happened is that this default mode, they're still internally oriented, but the default mode network is dampened down. Uh, and so they're able to just have more uh, of, a, of a quiet state. And it is the case that uh, trained contemplatives with a lot of practice, uh, one of the major things that you see is a reduction in activation of the default network. So the, the other two networks would be uh, active at that point. Salience network 
says, pay attention to this, it's new, pay attention to this, it's new, and you're always doing that. That's right. And then the central executive network, just to get really nerdy here, I, we're beginning meditators, you have to pay, you have to use that a lot, I have to keep my mind on my breathing. But after a while, that quiets down too, right? Yeah. So really, it's just, when you're, met, when you're witnessing, it's really just the salience network working. I think, I think that's right. I haven't seen, uh, I definitely know that the executive, uh, the default mode network uh, damps down. I, it, it, which is, it makes great sense, logically speaking, that um, the executive network would, uh, would damp down, but I, I haven't seen that uh, study. I haven't either, and I think nobody's done it. That's okay. why I, that's, I keep waiting for them to tell me what I'm telling people right. to do. Yeah. It stands to reason. <laughs> okay, right, so, um, at this point, do you think any uh, AI machine is, is truly conscious? And um, if not, do you think that it's plausible that a machine would become truly conscious? We've already touched on this to some degree. I, I definitely think it's possible that a machine could become truly conscious. I also think it's possible that uh, they won't become truly conscious. Particularly possible that the kind of uh, computers that we have right now, uh, which are uh, digital, uh, that th they won't. It's possible that um, digital computers will not become conscious ones that just sort of do uh, Turing machines, but that uh, they will invent quantum uh, uh, computers, and that possibly uh, they could become conscious, and that somehow consciousness, uh, understanding consciousness, will involve understanding uh, quantum machines. It's also possible that life is somehow uh, a, an element that is uh, necessary for consciousness and perhaps they will find a way to make uh, living machines. Uh, and then, um, as I said, it's also possible that we are all in the machine right as we speak. <laughs> all right, I don't know if this is an appropriate question or not, but... <laughs> What's your best guess about the answer to the hard problem? Mm. That's not an interesting question, right, Robert? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my uh, best guess is that consciousness is a fundamental aspect of the universe. That there are some things that physical systems um, some, some way in which all physical systems have a, a potential for consciousness, I suspect that it has something to do with vibration, that, uh, that conscious entities are somehow moving, oscillating in time in a, um, in a particular way. I also suspect that there are additional <coughs> dimensions to reality. And that in addition to there being the standard objective time that we always talk about, that there may be another dimension of subjective time. And that we are essentially, each one of us are uh, windows that are moving in objective time relative to subjective time. And this gets us out of the problem of the block universe being in every moment uh, at once. And while we're postulating additional dimensions of time, I also imagine that there's a third dimension of time, alternative time, so that we're windows that are moving in objective time relative to subjective time and have a little bit of wiggle room so that we can, um, in one way or the other, manifest uh, alternative possible next moments. <laughs> that one might require more probing. <laughs> Oh yeah, um, the stuff about vibration, I just want to make a comment about it. Um, uh, one of your colleagues, Gary Horowitz, has been here a couple of times, mm -hmm. and um, amazingly didn't confuse anybody. He, he was so clear that he brought us through a history of 20th century physics, and then he talked to us about string theory, and nobody's eyes rolled, which was mm -hmm. unbelievable. Um, this was a while back, some of you probably rec remember it, but one thing that he said, he said, don't ask me about consciousness, I'm a physicist. But after he left, um, or I, as he was leaving, I said, I just want to un understand what you're saying about string theory. Um, he said, string theory, is it true 
Dr. Horowitz, that what you're saying is there's only one thing called a string, and that depending on how it vibrates, it makes all the multiplicity of the universe. And he said, yeah. And when he left, I said, doesn't that sound spiritual to you? There's only one thing, and depending on how it breathes or vibrates, creates the whole. Um, so what you're saying is, is uh, consciousness could work like that. It could be um, different kinds of consciousness could be dependent upon different kinds of vibration. You know? Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's parallel with what Gary said. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't want to talk about consciousness, and I think this is uh, one of the challenges that. Uh, that the field faces is that uh, people uh, don't feel comfortable outside of their comfort zone. Uh, it's that, uh, the physicists don't feel comfortable uh, really thinking about consciousness. The consciousness researchers, with some exceptions, don't feel uh, comfortable thinking about the physics. And so there's, there aren't enough people who are willing to sort of <coughs> experts in, in both areas to think about the uh, potentially profound linkages. I mean, between mind and body, yeah. Right. And well, and also between, yeah, between physics and consciousness and the understanding of the different realms. It's good that people like you are trying to uh, integrate those two. Uh, yeah, I, I'm trying, but uh, at the same time, I only, my understanding of physics is, is, is quite limited, and I think this also leads to challenges where the physicists when people do try to do it, the, they're, they're getting things wrong, and then the physicists are like, ah, these people are, are hacks. They, they don't really know what they're talking about. And then rather than uh, sort of helping them to understand what they're talking about, um, they just dismiss them. All right, so um, back to the easy questions. Um, do you think psychedelics lead to greater consciousness or to delusion? Uh, both. I think, <laughs> I think that uh, psychedelics are a, a very powerful uh, technique for uh, exploring consciousness. I think that it is very likely that we have no idea the number of uh, inventions and visions and uh, advances that have been the product of psychedelics where people didn't mention that that's where the idea uh, came from. Um, I think also that there, uh, one of the things that happens with creativity is there are two elements. There is the generation phase of having uh, very powerful new connections that haven't been made before. And then there's the evaluation phase of uh, evaluating and testing it, does this really make sense? I think that uh, psychedelics and marijuana and, and, and perhaps alcohol, yeah, probably <coughs> alcohol, uh, affect both of these elements. They increase the likelihood of having novel associations. Uh, they can increase the excitement on the discovery of those novel associations, but they also can uh, impair the capacity to evaluate the idea. So uh, many times individuals will have these sort of grand ideas uh, on a psychedelics, but in the light of uh, in the clarity of the uh, executive network kicking in and really being able to sort of evaluate what's going on, they're realizing, oh, it's, it's not, uh, it, there's a fundamental flaw with it, or perhaps they're so connected to it that they're not even able to see. They got so attached to the idea that they had in that state that they aren't even able to see how off the mark it, it really is. So um, I think they definitely have a, a place, but I think uh, they can also create uh, delusions. They're probably more likely to probably more likely to come up with some crazy delusional idea uh, in in that context. So um, uh, proceed with caution. Um. How do you look at spirituality? Um, I think that there's two aspects to, to this question. The one question is the metaphysics of it. You know, to what degree is there a, a foundation to uh, spiritual beliefs? And then the second element is the, uh, the value of it independent of that. 
uh, there is incredible research on the placebo, on the power of the placebo, on the power of belief. And it seems that a spirituality can, at a minimum, serve as a, uh, a potentially uh, strong placebo for people, uh, giving them uh, resolve and confidence and essentially tapping uh, into their own uh, conscious uh, capacities. So in a certain sense, the power of the placebo is, uh, and the power of belief is a demonstration in the value and, and merit of spirituality just by virtue of its capacity for being able to allow you to uh, engender um, uh, capacities that you might not have otherwise been able to do. But that's all true independent of the metaphysics of whether or not there's any truth there. And then, of course, there's the other <coughs> problem which you find in spirituality so often, which is that people somehow routinely find themselves believing, I'm right, my vision is right, your vision is wrong, we're the in-group, you're the out-group, and all of the terrible, um, and this is perhaps more religion than spirituality, depending on how you define it, but the association of, of creating in-groups and out-groups and all the people who have died um, because they were in the out-group of spiritual convictions is, uh, is a big issue. Beautiful answer. Um, essentially, well, first off, it's still possible in the same way that we may be uh, tapping into uh, realms that we don't appreciate. Um, it, it, is, it is certainly possible that there is a realm of platonic forms and that somehow creative ideas exist in some sort of uh, ether of uh, ideal platonic realm that, that we um, uh, don't fully understand. I, I think um, to dismiss that out of hand is uh, premature at best. Um, at the same time, there's also um, clearly we are always gathering information and our brains are integrating and recombining. That is a constant process. It happens all the time in all sorts of different ways. We're putting things uh, together. Uh, there seems to be consolidation processes that take place in the brain, and those consolidation processes of distinct elements uh, is clearly also part of the creative process. We've done research looking at when do people have their creative ideas, and we find that uh, about um, 15 to 20 percent of the ideas that people have happen when they're not at work and when they're not actively pursuing solving the problem. They're just taking a shower, doing gardening, and then boom, some idea pops into their head, which is a creative idea. And we find that these creative ideas that they have while uh, engaging in uh, non-demanding tasks can be as uh, creative as the ones that they happen when they're at their desk. So many of our best ideas happen when we're not even actively looking for them. Interestingly, the one way in which we find these ideas different from other ideas is that when people have these sort of out of the blue ideas, they're more likely to involve overcoming impasses. So you know, when you reach a problem, you go, I need to sleep on it. Well, sleep on it, mind wander on it, recognize that this incubation process may be particularly useful for helping you to overcome some problem where you weren't able to see the solution when you were working on it before. Um, so if we want to increase our creativity, um, how might we do that in a corollary question? Um, does mind wandering and daydreaming uh, promote creativity, and does mindfulness prevent creativity? Okay. <laughs> yeah. So um, this is a very interesting uh, question, which our lab is is actively trying to uh, sort out. And uh, my feeling is that there's a sweet spot. Um, let me introduce you uh, to a, a term that I'm, I'm sort of imagining could possibly catch on, it's sort of a, a mindfulness 2.0. Um, but to get there, let me first tell you about something known as openness to experience. So openness to experience is one of the big five personality traits. This is when they try to understand what are the characteristic qualities, let's see, you have introversion, uh, extroversion, neuroticism, conscientiousness, 
agreeableness and a openness to experience. Now, uh, it's interesting to look at the, the pattern of uh, change in these things over the lifespan. First thing to know is that, uh, in general, these personality traits tend to be pretty stable. If you were extroverted as a, a kid, you're probably still kind of extroverted and so on. But there is some progression uh, over the lifespan. Uh, first, the good news, uh, as people get older, they become less neurotic, which means they get generally happier. They become more uh, agreeable, which means they're uh, more pleasant uh, to be around. And they become more conscientious, which means they're more likely to you know, pay their bills and show up on time and, and do things like that. So a lot of very positive things happen as people get older. But one uh, arguable, possibly, downside is openness to experience declines. Openness to experience is curiosity, is uh, wonder, is um, uh, interest in trying new things that you haven't tried uh, before, uh, and so on. And so uh, one thing that I think would be, uh, it's also very highly correlated with creativity. Uh, so one thing that I think would be a great value would be to uh, cultivate openness to experience as a way essentially to help people stay curious and to help people stay uh, and, and enhance creativity. So I think cultivating openness to experience by doing new things, by learning to find new things rewarding may be very valuable. Now, there's also research on mindfulness. The, the relationship between mindfulness and uh, uh, creativity is, is very low. In some studies, it's actually negative. We found in some cases where the more mindful people were on some scales, the less creative they were uh, on some uh, measures. I, it's hard to know what, what's fully driving that part of that. may be that they're uh, a little bit uh, sort of rigid. So mindfulness, you're all, it's, 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 it's a very sort of disciplined thing. You're always trying to be right here, right now, very present, not letting your mind go off on flights of fancy. So the, the idea that I'm imagining is that we could perhaps uh, cultivate simultaneously both openness to experience and mindfulness. So openness to experience is very useful, but when you jump out of that airplane, you want to be sure to wear a parachute. You want to be discerning in your openness. You don't want to be open to everything. So mindfulness offers the opportunity to be discerning, to think about what is a good thing to be open about, what not. Is this really the time to do it? Mindfulness is great, it allows you to have uh, concentration and uh, well-being, but perhaps it's a little bit rigid, so openness to experience may uh, allow you to sort of uh, be a little bit more playful in your mindfulness, which leads to this, this, the construct that I'm sort of pushing, open mindfulness, which is a <laughs> mixture of both openness and mindfulness. So, because um, this is what I do, I, I do have a, um, a comment about that, which is, uh, I agree completely. Um, when you're first learning mindfulness, you, you make the attempt to keep coming back to the present moment and keep coming back to your breathing, and then you're not willing to let your mind go anywhere. But when you become accomplished at mindfulness, then you can, uh, and you do, allow everything to open up. So there, then your mind can play more uh, freely than it would generally play because you've given it total license and you just remain aware of it. Yeah, there are different kinds of contemplative practices. There's a the focus meditation, which is uh, sort of the easiest one uh, to start with. And then there's something known as open monitoring where you just watch <laughs> thoughts arise. And there is some evidence that open monitoring is more positively associated with creativity than is uh, mindfulness, or than, than is the general focus. But I do think even open monitoring, where you're still sort of <coughs> supervising uh, your mind, uh, could, uh, th there may be times when it's better to even let that part down, and just really just let your mind have a, a recess, and go wherever it wants, somewhat unchaperoned. Yeah, and I'm going to underline that. that. That's been a big contribution that you've made, which is that sometimes uh, the, the attempt to be mindful all the time may get in the way of some valuable uh, capacities that your mind has. To, to my mind, it's an alternating, op it's an alternate operating system you want to use it sometimes, but you don't want to get so rigid that you use it all the time. Exactly. Um, 
Does free will exist? <laughs> I, I oftentimes uh, joke that it, it depends what day of the week you ask me. Um, <laughs> there are three basic sort of takes on free will, and they all are sort of profoundly unsatisfying in, in one way or another. There is hard determinist, which is the easiest to explain, which basically says we don't have free will. That you can just think of us as dumb, it's just like dominoes, cause and effect, and each individual, everything they do is the absolute necessary product of uh, a, a chain of cause and event that's been happening since, uh, uh, since inception. And uh, that it, as a consequence, uh, we have no more free will than, a, uh, than any other ob material object uh, in this world, that is to say, none. Then there's the libertarian view, which says uh, that's not possible. It's evident that we have free will. I want to raise my hand, and I do. Consciousness is clearly uh, driving things, at least to some extent. It's not saying that, that I'm not constrained, but that within a certain boundary, uh, I have uh, a genuine capacity to choose between real alternative futures. And then, uh, okay, so the, the downside, obviously, with hard determinism is just that it's very unsatisfying. It doesn't fit with our feeling that, uh, that I have free will. The um, libertarianism fits with that experience. It's clear that I'm making decisions all the time. But how do you reconcile that with, with science, with, a, with existing in a cause and effect determinist world? And so then you have the compatibilists who basically say, ah, don't worry, you can have determinism and still have free will. Uh, it's, it's just not this metaphysical kind of free will, but clearly we are making decisions all the time. Clearly we are uh, the product of these uh, deterministic forces, but still we're making decisions, and so it's, that's the kind of free will that matters, and, and that's what we've got. That sounds great, but it, it's hard to get your head around how is that, what does that mean to have free will, but you're still purely determined. It, it seems like sort of a, a, a bait and switch kind of thing. The metaphor that I like um, is uh, a sailboat. So uh, a sailboat has uh, no power, uh, and um, it really uh, is at the whim of the winds, of the tides, of uh, the topography. Uh, and you don't, if you don't put out your sail and you don't put out your runner, it will go somewhere. But if you do take that rudder and put it in and then move, take advantage of the forces, you, you can't go anywhere. You'll, you can only go in the directions, you know, when, when the wind stops, you're not, you're, you're stuck, you're not going to be moving very much. But you have some capacity to control within a very constrained situation, but over time that allows you to get largely where you want to go. And so I find myself uh, leaning towards that kind of metaphor. And then also, as I mentioned, in my nested observer window of three dimensions of time, there's the capacity for the um, window to have a little bit of a turn in the same way that the rudder can turn a little bit in the sailboat. <laughs> <laughs> just one further thought about that. Um, on the physical level, we might be purely determined. But um, if consciousness is an emergent property, then um, perhaps at that emergent level, there's um, latitude. Right, so once, you're, uh, once you recognize that you so don't understand what consciousness is, or how it resides in this physical world, then that says that the world is not as clear cut so far as we thought. We can't say that we fully understand cause and effect because uh, we don't understand how consciousness relates to cause and effect. So to say, well, this challenges everything we know, perhaps we don't know as much as we think we did, which creates humility and perhaps the opportunity for some kind of genuine libertarian type of free will to uh, exist. I do think that um, it really is possible that there are dimensions of reality that we have not yet uh, understood that they relate to consciousness and through those additional dimensions and the capacity of consciousness to triangulate in those additional dimensions, the capacity for real free will is possible.
Let's talk about, this is a little off script, but that's good. Let's talk about a possible alternative uh, dimensions of reality. Is it, in your view, possible that right now, right here, there are other dimensions of reality that we're just, we don't have the, the physical capacity to apprehend? And if we're going to apprehend them at all, it will be through consciousness. I think it's likely that there are additional uh, dimensions of reality. Uh, that's certainly the view in string theory and uh, even in uh, these uh, sort of accounts of, um, uh, of, the, of the multiverse, uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion of the possibility of that and it seems to me to be quite plausible. Now, is consciousness uh, related to that? Uh, that's also, that's less clear, that's far less so I would say, you know, the one is, is, is probably a near certainty that they're unappreciated uh, dimensions. That they pertain to consciousness is much more speculative, but I think it's quite possible. It's possible that we are actually uh, existing, that there somehow are multiple strands of reality uh, going on, and consciousness, because we don't know what it is, perhaps you could be popping into, you know, another version of yourself. Uh, at that moment to moment to moment. So not understanding what consciousness is also gives us the license to speculate uh, about its possible capacity to <coughs> enter uh, alternative realms. <laughs> I have a, this is a question that, okay. Um, long time ago, I, uh, I asked a very well-known professor um, who was one of my teachers. Um, do you think that science is the only way to determine truth? And he said, yes. And I said, but what about the direct apprehension of truth by consciousness? And that was a question that, that kind of took him aback. What's, it, can we, can, can contemplatives find out stuff that we can't find out, that we haven't found out scientifically? Well, imagine that um, I was some famous scientist and I come up with uh, a quality machine. Quality is like internal experience. Uh, and I was able to uh, put this machine on your head. I've gotten like a Nobel Prize. I've gotten every possible award that uh, I could possibly have had. I'm, I'm, respected by everybody, and I've got this machine, and I, I put it on your head, and, and I go, oh, Spencer, I'm, I'm sorry, I've got some bad news for you. you. You think you're conscious, you think you're having an experience, but you're not. My guess is you wouldn't be like, oh, darn, uh, that's too bad, I guess I don't have consciousness. You'd be like, no, you're wrong, I know I have consciousness. I don't care if you're this Nobel Prize winning, yada, yada, yada. I know from my own experience. And I think this is many people's reactions. How do you know that? Clearly you don't know that from science. Science just told you you don't have it. But yet you would, you, your first person experience would trump everything that's said. And you'd be like, no, I know I do. How do you know you do? I'm the scientist. You, I know I do from my own first person perspective. So I think that it's, it's evident that we know things from our first person perspective that, that science could never uh, tell us. In fact, I think we know those things better than we know anything science can tell us. I think that there are three things that we know, and actually not only does science can't tell us about them, it, it doesn't even have a way to think about them. It can't tell, it doesn't know whether or not we're conscious. There's no independent way of, of measuring conscious, but that's the first absolute thing we know. What is consciousness? Consciousness is, in my opinion, and if you inspect your quality, you may have the same experience, it is the dynamic, it is the change, it is the movement in time, it is always nowing in a dynamic way. So consciousness has this, it's intrinsically dynamic, it's intrinsically evolving, even if it's in the present, just existing in the present, it's present to present to present. It turns out that physics has no account for the flow of time. In fact, uh, they, they speculate 
that time, or they, they say that the flow of time is an illusion of consciousness. I asked Brian Green once, uh, how do you reconcile the static view of uh, physics with the self-evident dynamic quality of subjective experience? And he said, uh, I see a psychiatrist. <laughs> 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 All sorts of illusion that the flow of time is just another. And then the third thing that is self-evident from first-person experience is that consciousness is always happening now. We are always in the now. It's now, now, now. You might think about the past, you might think about the future, but you're always in the now. It also turns out physics has no explanation for the privileged quality of, uh, of the now. So not only are there things that I know from my first person experience that physics or science could never tell me, but those are actually the things that I know better than anything in science. Science, this could all be an illusion. We could all, I could just, this could be like a weird dream, but even still, those three things would be uh, true. I do value science. I think science is absolutely right. There are all sorts of things that I could be wrong about, but those three things I know better than anything science could tell me. Because of your time constraint, um, I'm going to ask you now, to, is there anything that we haven't covered you want to express to this group of people on any level as a kind of a closing uh, comment? What I would say is that um, it's great that you all are here, that one of the best things that I think people can do is to cultivate their curiosity. And to cultivate that curiosity in a stance of what I call entertaining without endorsing, where you entertain ideas, you playfully listen to them, but you be careful about saying, it's like this, it can't be like that. And if you uh, sort of follow your passion, uh, Joseph Campbell said, follow your bliss, and what he meant by that is not just do the, you know, don't just like have a great time all the time, but follow your passion. If you follow your passion, if you follow your curiosity, and maintain this stance of entertaining without endorsing, I think that you can have a, uh, a really rich life and can be uh, an inspiration also to others. Um, yeah. Yeah. Without Obviously, because he finally got through half my questions, and you get to ask your questions, we'll have to have him back at some point. Um, we really do need to let, he has another commitment, but what we're going to do, so what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the video, that, that 10 minute video that you did, which is so good. Um, the one's on your website that I also have on YouTube, uh -huh. and so that will be a little bit more of um, Dr. Schooler.